Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I can see the screen. I can't see the audience, but if there's any questions, I'll rely on the moderator to relay them to me. Uh, otherwise, we'll have questions at the end as well. Um, what I wanted to do when I thought about this as an opening talk uh, was lay out a broad story about the search for what I call a second genesis of life. Uh, what, what are the possibilities of the next 20 years and how does in particular Europa and Enceladus fit into the picture. So the next slide, uh, can we get the next slide please? Uh, I want to define exactly what I mean by a second genesis of life. Even though we cannot define life in a very satisfying way, we can draw a, a circle, if you will, around life. And we can define what it means to be outside that circle. So we can define a second genesis of life and how to search for it much better than we can define life itself. And the diagram in the lower left of this slide shows our operational definition of life on Earth, all life that is related and has a shared biochemical and genetic history, that's life on Earth. When we search for a second genesis, we're searching for something that's not on that tree. It doesn't share that biochemistry, doesn't share that genetic history. What I'm calling here in red, life 2.0. And if we find it, it would tell us that life is common in the universe. And I've got a little editorial comment there in gray, yay, it'd be nice to know that life is common in the universe. So as the little picture shows, what we're looking for are aliens. And we have a definition of aliens. Aliens are not on our tree of life. So the next slide, uh, talk about in the next 20 years, where and how might we find a second genesis? And I'm listing five approaches. Uh, first, we might find evidence of life on an exoplanet. It's hard, they're far away, but I wouldn't rule out or I wouldn't uh, underestimate the ingenuity of astronomers. So uh, the first thing they'll search for is oxygen, rich atmospheres on a on a Earth-like planet, and who knows where what will go, what we'll do from there. But that'll advance very quickly. The next one I'll talk about is the one most relevant to the topic of this think tank: is biochemistry, searching for biochemistry and organics that we get from Mars or Enceladus or Europa if we find organics there. That's our solar system, the water worlds of our solar system. The third candidate, a long shot, but one to be considered is finding life on Titan living in liquid methane and tracking it down by its consumption of hydrogen. And fourth, we're moving away from space exploration, the idea is to make it in the laboratory. And I will submit that the easiest, most direct, and first way to do that should be to create mirror life in the laboratory. And then the fifth method, the wild card, uh, the joker, can, can trump all the others, of course, but is completely unpredictable and beyond our control, is we receive a signal from SETI. And I'm not going to mention that because that's ex discussed extensively elsewhere. Okay, so let's get to the next slide, please. Uh, very quickly, let's talk about extrasolar planets. Uh, this, this, con that, this discussion is really motivated by the discovery of Kepler 186f. Finally, an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of a cool, reasonably cool star, long-lived cool star. Uh, not exactly Earth, it's not exactly the Sun, but it's pretty close. We don't know the conditions on the surface, but this is an example, the explosion of discoveries on exoplanets is an example of why uh, we need to look there for a second genesis as well. The next slide shows the way that these technologies are moving. Uh, can we get the next slide please? Ground-based systems for seeing exoplanets are being developed ever larger, amazingly large telescopes are being built on very high mountains, uh, and of course space-based systems are being proposed. Uh, this, there's a lot of support and funding for astronomy 
it greatly exceeds that of planetary science and the astronomers have been extremely successful in utilizing their tools to probe these distant worlds so I would uh, think that we may learn we may get more clues about life elsewhere from searching exoplanets than our solar system. In any case, it'll be a race. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure I'd bet against the astronomers. The next slide shows, takes us to our solar system, to the favorite world of many astrobiologists, Mars. Uh, this is just a one image history of Mars comparison to Earth. Early Earth, early Mars, both were water worlds. They're not now. And the reason is Mars is smaller than the Earth, no plate tectonics, less gravity, no magnetic field. This is my one slide introduction explanation story of Mars. Next slide, I want to quickly share with you some results from Curiosity, the current mission to Mars. Next slide, please. I think one of its most interesting results is these results from Yellowknife Bay. Uh, next slide shows in particular some locations within Yellowknife Bay and two dots, uh, John Klein and Cumberland, where we actually drilled into this uh, mudstone. What we're looking at on Mars is a mudstone. This mudstone, uh, I think, is the most interesting place we've ever investigated on Mars. Next slide shows why it's so interesting. If we think of the history of this site, <coughs> Yellowknife Bay, it is really an ideal site for astrobiology. It's in a, in a crater that formed three and a half billion years ago, 3,500 million years ago. It's soon thereafter filled with water. Deposits were deposited in the bottom of this water. They became compact and buried and turned into mudstones. These mudstones were exposed only 70 million years ago at the sites where we drilled by erosion. So these are incredibly well-preserved sediments from the bottom of a lake. How much better could you ask for in terms of astrobiology? So I want to quickly show you why I'm enthusiastic about lake bottoms. The next slide shows a picture of our camp on an Antarctic lake, ice-covered Antarctic lake a very good analog for lakes on Mars. Even in early in Mars history, it would have been cold, lakes would have been ice covered, no one would have been camping on them, but uh, next slide shows what we do when we're there. We're drilling into the ice cover, taking samples. Next slide shows us diving in the ice uh, to see what's in the bottom. The next slide reveals why this is such an interesting lake, why I like to point to it as an analog for Yellowknife Bay on early Mars. The bottom of this lake in Antarctica, there's large mounds, 30, 40 centimeters uh, mounds produced by microscopic life. Uh, these structures are analogs for early Earth and early Mars. The next slide now is a close-up of this mudstone at Yellowknife Bay. Uh, just looking at it, it looks like everywhere else on Mars red, red, rusty, oxidized red. The next slide shows the first hole we drilled and what I think is the first big discovery, the first big result from Curiosity, which is we found gray Mars. Everywhere else previous missions have been to on Mars, it's been red. Red Viking, red at Viking 2, red at Pathfinder, red at Mir, it's been red everywhere. But here, here we reached gray Mars for the first time. Next time step shows, uh, should pop up the pictures of the meteorites. Can you click the advance once? Next slide. Yeah, we knew that there was a gray Mars underneath the red from the meteorites. Here's two Mars meteorites, so they're gray. Uh, but they came from impacts which excavated deep rock. Here at this mudstone, we were able to reach gray Mars by just drilling a few centimeters. Quite remarkable. Uh, this is now what I think is my favorite site on Mars for astrobiology. If I could go anywhere on Mars, uh, I would land right here and dig deeply into this mudstone for a sample. The problem with it in terms of a follow-on mission is that 
this uh, site is quite small. But this is the big discovery. Next slide shows something I think is uh, interesting. Two things shown interesting in this slide. This is an analysis of one of these gray drill sites. It contains oxygen released from perchlorate decomposition. This mudstone, isolated for billions of years, has perchlorate in it, releases oxygen, the most oxidized form of chlorine, and at the same time, it has hydrogen sulfide and smells like rotten eggs when you heat it up. I mean, isn't that a paradox? How does this sample, the bottom of a lake bed, preserved for billions of years, contain both the most oxidized form of chlorine and the most reduced form of sulfur simultaneously in the sample? Uh, it's really a puzzle, and we don't, we don't get it yet. The next slide shows what I think is curiosity big result number two first discovery of nitrates in the soil on Mars, and very mysteriously, their apparent excellent correlation with perchlorate. Uh, that's it. interesting. Next slide shows that perchlorate and nitrates do correlate on Earth, but the ratio is four orders of magnitude different, five orders of magnitude different than it is on Mars. So if five orders of magnitude doesn't bother you, maybe we've got a story we understand here. Uh, the next slide is what I think of Curiosity's big result number three, first confirmation of fluorine on Mars. Now, we expected fluorine on Mars from meteorite studies, but the ChemCam results published earlier this year was the first direct measurement of fluorine on Mars. The next slide answers the question in your mind, why do I care about fluorine? Well, if you've read the papers on terraforming, you know that fluorine is useful for warming Mars. Uh, okay, the next slide, uh, chlorobenzene on Mars is the first detection of a Martian organic. Curiosity, big result number four. The next slide shows the reason why we think it's a robust detection, despite the contamination in the instrument. Uh, the chlorobenzene concentration at Cumberland was much higher than in the other samples or the blanks which which recorded the contamination level. And right now, this summer I have a student going back to the Viking results, plowing through the old Viking results to see if there's a trace of chlorobenzene there that might have gone undetected uh, or maybe just above the, the noise limit and not recognized, but would come out recognized if we focused in on it. The next slide shows why these organics on Mars don't really excite me because they're almost certainly just meteoritic organics. And what we're finding, what this chlorobenzene represents, any organics that Viking saw, are probably almost certainly just stuff that's fallen in from meteorites. Think Murchison, Orgel, Tagish Lake, meteorites landing on Mars, decomposing, uh, this is exactly what you'd expect. So there may be organics on Mars. There's not much so far. Unfortunately, don't have good instrumentation for detecting it yet because of perchlorate, but we're working on it. The next slide uh, takes us to a much more promising world, and in fact, my favorite world right now, Enceladus. Jets of water discovered in 2009, predicted I expected there for many years before because of the E-ring of Saturn. Next slide shows our conception of where these jets are coming from. Uh, liquid water, reservoirs, oceans, heating, hydrothermal systems in it. Next slide shows why these systems are so exciting. They contain, not the jet is not just water, it's the soup, it's organics, it's ammonia, it's a whole bunch of stuff. Next slide shows the best part of it all, three samples. It's a jet in space, we can just grab them. Uh, we don't have to drill, we don't have to go through ice, we don't have to do anything, we just fly through and get it. Next slide shows a mission concept that we're working on, a joint U.S.-Japanese mission uh, to do a combined spacecraft probe, which would sample the plume and bring it back to Earth. Um, programmatic model is conceding. U.S. would build the 
bus. Japan would build a probe, similar to what they did for Hayabusa. Uh, but this is a very interesting problem. The next slide illustrates why it's an interesting problem. The challenge of returning to Earth an astrobiological sample, which might contain life from a habitable world. We've never done that before. And the background picture here is Genesis, which crashed when it landed. We've done three sample returns from beyond the moon. One of them crashed. One out of three is not a good record when you're talking about bringing back a sample, which you hope has life in it. So the next slide expands on this logic. What are the solutions to this problem of bringing back a habitable sample? Well, there's two solutions. One is send astronauts up to meet the sample and have them bring it back to Earth in a human-rated vehicle with human-in-the-loop safety system. That's the best sample solution to my mind. But that solution is not a solution that one can propose in a discovery mission. So put that aside. The other solution is to just bring it back like a rock. Parachutes, no heat shields, nothing to deploy. All it does is fall to Earth and it's designed to land that way. So that's the approach we're taking right now. Uh, still issues to be worked out. Now I want to move away from water. Let's go to the next slide, please. And then next slide. And Titan. Titan is interesting because it's the only world beyond the, besides the Earth in our solar system that has beaches. And beaches are wonderful things. Beaches are where water, liquid, uh, land, and air come together. And they could be very interesting for life. And so very quickly, the next slide summarizes the energetic argument for life on Titan in liquid methane. The next slide approaches the uh, question of how do you detect it. And I conclude that the way to detect life is to look for its pollution. This is a robust method. It works on Earth. Life on Earth is widespread. And it has global pollution. We call it oxygen, methane, and CO2. Titan, if life was there in liquid methane, it would be life widespread. It would also have global effect, attenuating, consuming hydrogen. The next slide shows the detailed prediction. The next slide shows uh, how that would be implemented in the, in the probe. Unfortunately, the Huygens probe used hydrogen as a carrier gas, so the hydrogen signal is not good. But this is the prediction. If there's life on Titan, it's eating hydrogen in the lower parts of the atmosphere. Okay, let's turn now to the final thought here, uh, which is, next slide please, which is not finding life, but making it. And I would submit to all you synthetic biologists in the audience that the first life we ought to make is a mirror life. Um, mirror life would be clearly a second genesis. Right? Uh, and here in the footnote, I've added a little puzzler for you to think about. Why do mirrors reserve, reverse left and right, but not top and bottom? Uh, next slide shows what I mean by mirror life. The obvious thing, you just take an E. coli cell and you create the cell, the mirror image, in which every chiral molecule in the cell has been replaced by its mirror image. We think that it'll work fine. Uh, I've added the rabbit to the one side to indicate that we're not sure that the mirror world is the same as the regular world. Everything we've done so far suggests that it is. How to do this? This is a daunting problem, but we could take it one step at a time. And by asking, where is the gatekeeper? for chirality in biology. Next slide is the hypothesis that the gatekeeper is the protein protein that carries amino acids to the ribosome. And that protein only carries currently left-handed amino acids. Next slide shows our hypothesis is that if that protein tRNA synthesis were constructed from D amino acids, then it would bring D amino acids to the ribosome. And so the idea is to go into the synthetic biology lab and make tRNA synthesis out of D amino acids, stick it in a cell, and have it ferry D amino acids to a, a ribosome, and the ribosome will duly staple them together and make D proteins. So the point here is to try to show 
how close we can be to making life in the lab. So there's a race I see it, a horse race between making life in the lab, finding it in Enceladus and maybe Mars, and finding it on exoplanets. Um, so, and then of course SETI is a wild card in that same race. Uh, now my energies are in the search for life on other worlds, so I spend my time on Enceladus and Mars. But I would love for any of these methods to succeed. The next slide uh, is just a way to open up the concept that if we find a second genesis of life, we need to think about what does that mean in terms of the moral status of these alien microbes, particularly if they're near us, like Mars or Enceladus. And I won't go through this chart in detail, but I'll point out that these considerations of moral status has implications for what we do now in terms of how we uh, how we explore. I know this is, I saw as you, were, as you were scanning the audience, Charlie Coquel in the audience, hello Charlie, I know you've also thought about these issues. The next slide, the last slide, because I think I'm running late on time, is my clue to you and me that it's the end of the talk and maybe we have time for some questions. Thank you, Chris. I've got a question for you about second genesis of life in the solar system. Um, however unlikely this may be, if you had a second genesis of life in our own solar system, you still couldn't rule out that there wasn't some unusual organic that happened to exist in the protoplanetary disk of our own solar system early on. So in some sense it would be pseudo-replication, and true statistical independence would be to look at exoplanets that come from other protoplanetary disks. Um, do you agree with that, or is there, is there a way to rule that out so you can really look at the second genesis on Mars and say, yeah, that tells us something about life on the universal scale and not something just about our own protoplanetary disk? Right, right. Uh, it's a good point. I, I think it, it, it will depend on how strange the life is. Uh, if we find life, my favorite example when questions like that come up is Titan. We find life on Titan living in liquid methane, I think it's telling us something about the possibilities for life that's profound and widespread. So, um, now you can say, well, that's unlikely. Okay, but it, it shows that in, in principle, we can find something in our solar system that will tell us, that uh, allow us to draw, draw broad conclusions. Uh, but it's it's hard it's hard if we find things on Mars and Europa other water worlds it's hard to know how broad a conclusion we can draw in comparison to life on Earth uh, until we actually have the sample and are, are doing the comparison we, we may even have a hard time really convincing ourselves or our colleagues or the reviewers of our papers that it is a second genesis and not uh, a deeply rooted cousin even the argument that chirality would be a distinction. One could argue, well, at some point, life uh, had a mixed chirality. And so life with a opposite chirality is just a early uh, split on a branch. So it, it's a more problematic with the water-based worlds. So your question is, uh, is relevant more there. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, you did. Yeah, that's good. That's all. Okay, I think we're starting to run over now. So thank you, Chris. You can go and get some sleep. I appreciate your right. your joining yeah. us here. Thank you so much. My pleasure.